Hello, welcome to Engineers Mindset. Today we are going to start a class on sharp force and bending moment analysis. But to do that, um, let's first of all understand the different kinds of supports and, um, and types of loadings we can encounter while carrying out sharp force and bending moment analysis. The first type of support I want to talk about is what is called the pinned support. Okay, what is called the pinned support? Okay, the pinned support actually looks triangular in shape. So you can see something like this. Okay, this is how the pinned support looks like. Okay, so we can actually this all the support. Um, it's called a support because it's usually used to support a beam or used to provide assistance to a beam. So on a beam, we can always see, let's say we have this beam, then we have this support at point A, let's call this point A, and also we have this beam support, this is point B. So this actually shows a pin support, used to provide assistance or support to the beam. Now, in order to apply the free body diagram of a pin support, we always have what is called two reactions, one vertical and one horizontal to the point of occurrence of the pin. Okay, so to carry out the free body diagram of this, FPD, we are simply going to have the pin. In place of the pin at point A, we always have two reactions. One of the reactions is vertical to the point of occurrence. The other reaction is horizontal also to the point of occurrence. This is point A. We will simply use R A Y to signify reaction at point A. Y shows vertical. We also have R A S to signify reaction at point A. X means horizontal. Okay, so same thing applies there. Um, since we have a pin at point B, we simply also have this is the vertical reaction R D Y. And we also have a horizontal reaction R B S. So R means reaction, B means at point B, X means horizontal. R also means reaction B at point B. So this is point B, and Y means particle and um, particle. So whenever we encounter a P on a B, we always have two reactions for the P. One is particle and one is horizontal. All of them are acting towards the point of occurrence. One well, other support I will talk about is what is called um, the ruler support. Okay, so we have the ruler um, support. Okay, so ruler support actually has about two different um, forms. You can see triangular um, with balls or rules, um, something like this. Okay, this is actually called the ruler. This circle is what called it the ruler. So that's what differentiates the ruler from a pin. It can also occur in this form, um, just a single circle like this. Okay. This is also called a ruler. So if I you see that circle or that ball, it's called a ruler. So like I said, it is called a support because it is used to provide assistance to a beam. So let's say we have a beam. Okay, this is point A, and then we have a ruler. Um, okay, or we have this as well. So it must also appear in this form, this is point B. Okay, so these are the two ways in which the ruler can be represented. Also, to align the free body diagram, uh, every ruler has what is called just one reaction, but the reaction is always normal to the surface. Okay, the free body diagram of the ruler shows only one reaction. That reaction is normal. Normal simply means that the reaction is always at 90 degrees to the surface. So if I have, um, if I to write the free diagram of this thing now, I'm going to have, in place of this order, I will just have one reaction at 90 degrees to the surface. So this is 90 degrees. Okay, since this reaction is vertical, I can simply call this R A Y. Similarly, um, we also see there's a ruler at point B to also indicate it was uh, because it is one reaction normal to the surface. So we simply have just one reaction, R, B, Y. It must always be at 90 degrees to the surface, okay? This is point B. So the reactions must always be at 90 degrees to the surface. So it is clear that 
whenever the beam is horizontal, the reaction to the roller is always a vertical reaction because the beam is in the horizontal. Whenever the beam is horizontal, the reaction to the roller is always a vertical reaction. So you might just simply go ahead and see the fruits and vertical reaction whenever you find that roller for horizontal beams. But if the beam is a vertical beam, it means that a roller will always have a horizontal reaction. Let's say for instance, I have a vertical beam. Okay, so this is a vertical beam. And uh, let's call here point A and this is point B. Then at point A we have a roller. Okay. Same thing as at point B, we also have a roller. Okay, so the order at this point is going to change because for a roller, we always have a reaction to what normal to the surface. Okay, so we're simply going to write this. The free body diagram will now be um, this is the vertical beam, this is point A, and this is point B. Since we said the reactions must always be normal to the surface, so we are basically going to have a um, reaction at point A, it must always be at 90 degrees to the surface. So this becomes R A X X now because this reaction is now what? Horizontal. So we simply call it R A X, reaction at A X. Also, at point B, the reaction must always be normal or at 90 degrees to the surface. So we simply have R B S. So that's, it. So that's how to differentiate the ruler from a pin. A pin always have two reactions, one particle and one horizontal. Meanwhile, the ruler always have one reaction, but the reaction must always be at 90 degrees to the surface. So for a horizontal beam, automatic, the reaction is going to be one particle. But for a particle beam, the reaction is going to be the horizontal. Okay so, okay, so that is that for the kinds of support we can encounter while analyzing shear force and bending moments. Okay. Um, let's now talk about let's now talk about the types of loops we can encounter while carrying out bending moment and shear force analysis. The first kind of loop I will talk about is called the point loop. Okay. The point load. Alright, so what is a point load? A point load is simply what? A concentrated load. Just a single load acting at a particular point. So it's called a point load. A load whose entire effect is felt at a particular point. For instance, let's say I have the beam um, A and D and then I have this load of 10 kN. Okay. This 10 kN load acting at point C is called a point load because the entire effect of the load is being felt at point, at point C. So it is called a point load. Also, it can be called a concentrated load. Okay. Now, the next type of load I will talk about is what is called um, the uniformly distributed load. Okay. Uh, uniformly distributed load. This is one. Okay, distributed load. Alright, so the short form can be called UDL. So we can call it UDL. That's uniformly distributed load. Now, this load has different forms um, to which it appears. Okay, we can always see the UDL to be, let's say we have a beam. This is A and this is B. Okay, so the UDL can be in this form. Here can be in this form. Let's also consider another beam A. Let's call this B and C. We can as well have the UDL to be in this form. Okay, something like this. That's also a UDL. We can also take uh, this form. Let's see here is A, B, and C. We can also take this form. Um, okay. Alright, so that is how these are the two ways in which the UDL can look like. Their low intensity is usually in newtons per meter. Their low intensity is usually in newtons per meter. Newtons per meter. Okay? Their low intensity is usually measured in newtons per meter. Now, what is a UDL? A UDL is simply a type of support or a load whose intensity spread uniformly 
from one portion of the beam across a certain portion of the beam or from one portion of the beam across the entire length of the beam. So for instance, in this case from A to B, you get expressed from the beginning of the beam to the end of the beam across the entire length of the beam. Meanwhile, from here A to B here, you get spread from the certain portion of the beam from A to a certain portion of the beam that's up from A, not across the entire length. But the intensity of the beam remains the same. So it is called a uniformly distributed load. Now let's say I have a U here um, whose intensity is actually 5 kilonewtons per liter. This is point A, this is point B, and this is point C. Now the reason why this is called a uniformly distributed load, let's say the length of this here is 3 meters. This portion is 2 meters. And I decide to section this point out. Let's call the other point X. And I section this point. Let's say distance from point A to the point of section is simply on X. Let's call it the new distance. So it means I'm not going to have this is the point of the section. So I'll actually have this in here. This is point A. Distance from A to the point of section is said to be what X. Okay. It is called a uniform distributed load simply because even after sectioning, this load intensity still remains. 5 kilonewtons per meter. It doesn't change. So the, the, the load is uniform across the entire portion of the beam or across the certain length of the beam. So if even if I take out some part of it, it doesn't change the amount of the load. The only thing that might alter is that the length might differ. That is why here we simply use X to represent the length. The length might differ, but the intensity of the load still remains the same. It doesn't change. So even if I cut this beam in, even if I split this side again, it still remains 5 kilonewtons per meter. It doesn't change. So it's called a uniformly distributed load because the intensity is uniform across the entire length of the beam or across a certain portion of the beam. Okay? Now, there is always a need to convert the UDL to a point load. There is always a need to convert a uniformly distributed load to a point load. To do this, since the intensity of the UDL is always measured in newtons per meter, it means for us to convert the load because the real unit of a load is simply what? Newtons or kilonewtons. Okay, so that's the real unit of a load. It can be in newtons, it can be expressed in kilonewtons. So when a load is expressed in kilonewtons per meter, it simply means for us to be able to convert that load to a point, we have to multiply the UDL load by the length to the length covered by the UDL. Okay, so take that again. To convert a UDL to a point load, to convert a uniformly distributed load to a point load, simply multiply the intensity of the UDL to the length covered by the UDL. So let's say in this case now, alright, so let's say in this case here we have a UDL whose intensity is 5 kilometers per meter and the length is simply was 3. Meter. So this is the length covered by the UDL. In order to convert this UDL to a point load, what do you do? Simply multiply the intensity of the UDL, which is 5 kilonewtons per meter, multiply it by words, the length covered by the UDL. So the length covered only by the UDL is 3 meters. So we simply have times 3 meters. So notice here that this is simply 3 times 5 kilonewtons per meter multiplied by meter, which is this. So this theta actually cancels this meter. I've not been able to convert this load was into a point load. So 10 times 5 simply gives me 15 kilo newton. So this becomes a point load. Alright, so to convert the UDL to a point load, simply multiply the intensity of the UDL to the length covered by the UDL. Now after doing this, since you've converted the point load, you now have to place this point load on the beam. To place this point load on the beam, you place it at the middle of the length covered by the UDL. So get the length covered by the UDL, then divide it by two, that becomes the middle of the length. And in this case, the length covered by the UDL is equal to 3 meters. So that simply means that I'm not going to have my B. This is point A, this is point B, and this is point C. So this point that I've converted now will not be at the middle of the length, middle of 3 meters. So get the length and divide by 2. Middle of 3 meters is simply 3 divided by 2. And that is 1.5. So at, from this end, it's going to be 1.5 kilowatts to the point two. So I'll simply have uh, here 15 kilonewtons. Distance from point A to that point is simply 1.5 meters. 
and this has some um, point to the point B is the one point five meters. Okay, so you have this. So to convert the UDL to a point root, simply multiply the intensity of the UDL to the length covered by the UDL. That becomes a point root. To place this point root on the, on the beam, place it at the middle of the length covered by the UDL. So simply get the length covered by the UDL and divide it by two. That becomes a mid portion of the length. Okay, so that's why you have this. Now let's say we have a UDL of this intensity across the entire length of the beam. Okay, something like this. And let's call this to be 10 kilo newtons per meter. This is point A and this is point B. Let the entire length of the portion simply be 5 meters. So from what I said, to convert this now to the point to the free body diagram that comes. Okay, this is point A, this is point B. To convert this to a point to simply what? Multiply the intensity of the load, which is 10 kilo newtons per meter, by the length covered, okay, to the length covered by the UDL. The length covered by the UDL is 5 meters, because in this case now, the UDL is across the entire length of the beam. So you simply have 10 times 5, and that's 50. It becomes a point to so 50 kilo newtons as a point to. Now, you position this point to at the middle of the length. The middle of the length is simply now 5 divided by 2, and that's 2 point So from each end, it is 2.5 to the root or from the root. So we simply have here, 50 kilo meters. This load is now at 2.5 meters from point A or 2.5 meters from point B. So you simply have this. So that is how you convert a uniformly distributed load to a point load. Okay, so the next kind of load I'll talk about is uniformly varying load. So you have this uniformly varying load. So the short form is actually U V L. Okay? The short form is actually U V L. Now a U V L actually has one loop. Okay, so you can always find U V L to look in this form. Okay, so it takes this to a triangular shape. Okay. That's what a UVL looks like. Alright, so uh, it is called a uniform varying load because its intensity starts from zero and increases up the maximum value. Okay, so a UVL is called it is called a uniform varying load because its intensity starts from zero and increases up the maximum value. So let's look at that UVL we have in the world. Let's say here is point A and here is point B. The intensity at point A of this UVL is actually what? Zero. So it increases from zero. At this point, the value is different. At this point, the value is different. At this point, it has a different value. T it gets to the maximum value. Also measured in newtons per meter. Okay? So it is called value load because the load intensity from the beginning is different from the load intensity at the middle. It's also different from the load intensity at the end. So it increases from zero up to the maximum Value. That's why it's called a uniformly varying load. Now, to convert a UVL to a point load, here is what you do. To convert a UVL to a point load, simply what? Take the area of the shape. This shape, this shape looks triangular in nature. That's the triangle. So it means that the point load for every UVL, point load is simply what? Area of the triangle, which is half base times height. This becomes the point load of the UVL. The base is simply the length covered by the UVL, while the height is simply the maximum intensity of the load of the UVL. So, for instance, if I have this UVL to have, um, let's say the value of the UVL is 10 kilo newtons per meter, and the length covered by the UVL is simply 2 meters, then to convert this now to a point load, it's simply equal to half. The base is the length of the UVL, which is 2 meters, so half base times 2 times the height. The height is what? The highest value of the UVL, which is what? 10 kilo meters per meter. So you have 10 times 10. And this is going to simply give us that P is equal to, if you evaluate this, you are going to have 10 kilo meters. So that is how you convert the uniformly varying load to a point where you simply take the area of the shape. Since the shape is triangular, then 
the point where it becomes area of the triangle, which is half base and height. The base denotes the length of the UVL, the length covered by the UVL, and then the height is the maximum load of the UVL. After converting the UVL to a point load, the next is to place this point load on the beam. Now, to place this point load on the beam, you simply place it at 1 over 3 of the length from the base or 2 over 3 of the length from the tip. That is simply 1 third of the length from the base or 1 two third of the length from the tip. Okay, so point B here shows the base of the UVL and point A, the starting point, shows the tip of the UVL. So after converting this UVL to a point load of 10 kilometers, we want to place this point load on the beam. You simply place it upwards. Uh, from the from the law is simply one third of the length from the base or two third as two over three of the length from the tip. Okay, so this is now equal to one over three. The length is simply was two meters. So that's one over three times two, which is actually two divided by three from the base. Or the length here is actually at least actually two over three times the length is two. And that's actually what 4 over 3 from the tip. Okay, so 2 over 3 is actually what 0 0.7, while 4 over 3 is actually 1.3. So it means if I want to place this point load now on the beam, it has to be what 0.7 from the base. That's from point B. So simply from point B, measure at 0 0.7 out of what 2 meters. So you simply go to somewhere around here, yeah, that's um, 10 kilo inches. And distance from the point of the road to point B is simply what? Um, um, simply um, 0.7 meters. Alright, so it means that distance from here to this point is automatically was 1.3 meters. So you have this. Okay. Now let's try more examples and see what we are going to have. Okay, let's say we have a UV here on the beam this time around. Uh, let's say we have something like this. Okay, call their point A, call their point B, call their point C, call their point D. And let the length of the UV here simply be 3 meters. Okay, and uh, let the intensity of the UV here be 5 kilometers per meter. Now, to convert this UV here to a point group, I simply say, Simply take what the area of the shape. Since it's triangular in shape, point load becomes so half. This is the length covered by the UVL. The length covered by the UVL is what? 3 meters. So you have half times 3 times height is the maximum load of the UVL, which is 5 kilometers times 5. So this is simply 15 divided by 2. That's 7.5 kilometers. So this is now a point load. So we break back the beam now. This is point A. The UV is between point B and point C. So we'll have point B and then we'll have point C. This is point D. And I said that to place this point in the 7.5 kilometers on the beam, simply what? Place it at one third of the length from the base. This is now the base. Or two thirds of the length from the tip. So one third of the length, the length is simply 3 meters. One over 3 over 3 simply from the base is simply 1 over 3 times 3. And that's 3 over 3 which is equal to 1 meters. So from the base, it's actually 1 meters. Meanwhile, from the tip, it's 2 over 3 of the length, 3 meters. And that's actually 6 over 3, which is actually what? 2 meters. So it means that from the tip, it should be placed at there 2 meters from the tip, since it has 1.6 tip. Simply take away 2 meters from 3, you are left for 1 meters. So this is where the load actually can be found. This is 7.5 kilo newton. So from this point to point C which is T, it is 2 meters. B by from the load to point B which is base is actually 1 meters. So that's how you convert the uniform interior load to a point load. Okay, and also that's how you position that point load on the beam. Alright, the next kind of loading I'll talk about is what is called hinge. Okay. Now what is the hinge all about? Hinge. This is Okay, now what is the hinge all about? How does it look like? A hinge normally looks like this. Um, okay, so you have something like this, like a donut. Okay, 
carry the load of then let's say five of all these key carry the load of key so the hinge always carries the load at the end it always carries the load so you can always measure the length from this point to the uh, where the hinge is the hinge is so called that L so the hinge is actually your door handle okay that's what the hinge is all about it's your door handle which is used to produce what um, um moment or couple it is used to produce moment or couple just to allow what for entrance so whenever you apply your force on your door handle your door knob or the handle what happens there's a clockwise moment or a couple that takes place before your door opens and then you can have entrance into your apartment so that's what the hinge is all about now two things play out Whenever we find a hinge on a beam, let's say for instance, I have a beam, um, call this A, call this B. Now I have a hinge at point B, carrying a load of 5 kN. So let's call here the length of the handle was 3 meters. So this is point B and this is point C. Alright, so we have this hinge now. The length of the handle is what? 3 meters. Now, to convert this hinge to a point load, first thing you have to pay attention to is that this load of 5 kN that is at this handle is actually felt at what? the base. This is called the base of the hinge. Okay, so the free point diagram will look like this. FBD, it will look like this. So this is point A, this is point B, and this is point C. Sorry, this is point C, this is point B. And this is point D. Now this load at point or on the handle, that's at point C. This load on the handle is actually felt at what the base point B. So the free body diagram will look like this. First of all, I will have this load 5 kN force feeling at what point B. So this is 5 kN. That's the first thing that comes to your mind. Once you apply the, your weight or your handle, of course, if you are applying your hand onto the handle of the door. You're actually exerting a force, a certain amount of force to the handle. But this force is felt at the base to open the door for you to have entrance into your apartment. So the same thing happens here. This force is actually felt here at the base. That's the first thing. Secondly, as you turn the door, there is what a clockwise, there is a moment or a couple. So a moment is formed, meaning that that force applied to the um, handle causes the handle to turn about at a distance, causing moment or couple. And that moment is simply the force applied times the distance traveled by the handle. So in this case, the distance traveled by this handle is 10 meters. The force applied is 5 kilometers. So we simply have another moment felt at point B. And that moment is simply what? 5 put the load times 3. And that will give us 15 kilonewtons meters. So this is what the free body diagram of a hinge support or a hinge load looks like. So whenever there is a hinge, First thing first, the load carried by the handle of the hinge is felt at the base of the hinge. That's the first thing. Then the second thing, that load makes what a moment also about the base. It makes a moment, and the moment is simply the force or the load carried by the hinge multiplied by the distance of the handle. That gives us what a moment also about. So this is what the free body diagram of the hinge actually looks like. Alright, guys, I will pause the video here, and in the next video, we can start analysis on shuffles and bending moment. Thank you very much.